Welcome to Bible Mind. Out on this rainy day, like a nest full of little baby birds with your mouths open up. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> uh, we are still in Romans 8, and we will be for a couple of more weeks. Although, I told you last week that uh, next week, the verses that we're going to cover in Romans 8 will tie to Romans 9. So we're going to pull Romans 9 into those verses, and then we'll finish Romans 8 and then go to Romans 10. So, you know, hang on. It's going to be a little bit of a roller coaster ride. Romans 8 begins by helping us understand that when we are in Christ, we do not have to feel condemned because we're not condemned. We have been redeemed and declared not guilty. The devil tries to wield uh, condemnation like a hammer, and, and tries to make you feel like you're not worthy, but you are not condemned, you are, you are redeemed, right? Uh, and so when you lift the shield of faith, you, you'll be able, to, uh, be able to fend off every blow. That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us and gives us life and power. And we're adopted as sons and daughters, heirs with Christ of all the Father has. And last week we talked about the Holy Spirit helps us when we pray. And so there you go. We are, we are caught up on Romans 8. Today we are going to dive into Romans 8, 28. And I'm going to read this in the New King James Version to begin with uh, because it's how I memorized it when, when I you know, was uh, you know, a young student of the Word. I got, uh, actually, the uh, New King James was published in 1982, and uh, my parents gifted me with a New King James Bible in 1982. And so it's like, you know... I've, I'm on the ground floor of this thing, right? <laughs> and so anyway, uh, but most of you will probably relate to uh, knowing it like this. And so let's say it together. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, other than like John 3.16 or Judge Not, <laughs> this is probably the third most uh, known scripture uh, in I guess in, in the world, you know, people, people know this scripture, people like this scripture. Usually just, they just say all things work together for good. That's what they quote as the scripture, right? Well, you know, all things work together for good. The Bible says that. Uh, and so we love this scripture because the world is full of suffering, right? And it brings comfort to think that even in this suffering, that good, good can come out of it and all things can work together for good. Uh, I'm going to read it, though, in the ESV, which is probably my primary translation now that, that I uh, look to. And it, it's the same thing, but it's just a little bit different order, okay? It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I know this is a little bit different order, but the ESV version is uh, really more in line with what the word-for-word -word Greek Reads Okay, so the word-for-word -word Greek would read something like, we know now that to those loving God, all things works together, God, for good, to those according to purpose called being. Okay, so if you did like a word-for-word, -word, that's what it would be. But since, uh, since it says the loving God, and then all things work together, and then according to his purpose, uh, and that's the flow that the ESV does, we're going to break it down today in that using the ESV, if that's okay with you. So it starts off with, and we know, right? And what does and mean? It's a connecting word. It's a, connect, it's a conjunction, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. How many of you remember conjunction, junction, what's your function? I don't remember the tune, but it was something like that. Uh, you know, I, there's not Saturday morning cartoons anymore, right? Most things are streaming, so you just cartoon whenever you want to cartoon. We, we don't have those little conjunction, junction, and if I was a bill and all that kind of stuff anymore. So, you know, uh, young parents, you don't even know anymore <laughs> the, the contribution. Here I am, you know, 97 years old, and I still remember conjunction, junction. Uh, but and, and ties it to something else, right? So if we're going to start a verse and say and, uh, we want to put it in context and see what was before that. So we're going to jump back up to verse 26 that we actually covered this last week. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us in groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit 
helps us in our weakness. We talked about last week when we don't know how to pray and he intercedes on our behalf. Uh, so the and we know part is a transition to announce the results of the intercession that of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we, we talked about the Holy Spirit intercedes. So this is kind of like the results. All right. Uh, so the sentiment of, a, of the whole is kind of like this. We are weak and don't know how to pray according to the mind and will of God. So the Holy Spirit steps in and intercedes. And we know when he does, good things happen. Okay, so that's kind of the way all this fits together. So uh, what does the word know mean? Understand. Understand? I didn't read it. What? Out the window and I heard others say, "What's the word no mean?" Well, it means no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no means no. Right? <laughs> Wrong enough. <laughs> yeah. K K N O E. That's why I put it up here. Well, it has to do with something in the mind. Okay. Maybe something we experience. <laughs> Wouldn't the root be knowledge? Okay. It would well no would be the root of the word knowledge, but you're right, ties to knowledge, so it's it's uh having knowledge in your brain, I guess, is 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 are the things that you know. Okay. Hey, no, look at looking it up on <laughs> looking it up on your phones. So uh let me ask you this. Can you know the future? <laughs> no, no, you can't. Can you not? Can you not know the future? You're not aware of it. Because you're not aware of it? Okay. So when when I was uh, in instrumentation school in Minden, Louisiana, as when Terry and I were dating, and we decided we were going to get married, and so I announced to my schoolmates that, you know, hey, I'm getting married in August or whatever. And uh, so, you know, they... Uh, best wishes and all this kind of stuff, but uh, also wishes of, you know, hope it works out. You know, I mean, you know, a lot of people get divorced, so we hope it works out for you or whatever like that. And I said, well, that's not going to happen to us. And they said, well, you can't know that. I'm like, well, I do know that. And they're like, there's no way you can know. I said, but I do know. And so they, they we had an argument is what it was. Because, I mean, we knew the commitment we were making to one another, and, and we agreed that it was going to be a lifelong commitment. And so because of that, I knew. And they're like, well, you know, things change sometimes. Like, I don't accept that. I know that we're going to, till death do us part, I know that, that we're going to be together for the rest of our lives. And I wasn't being, I wasn't being, it wasn't wishful thinking for me. It wasn't, uh, well, you know, I, I hope with you that, you know, this is true. This is what I want. No, I knew. And so it was as real to me as though it had already happened. Yeah. Okay. And so there are things that we know from the past, right? Because we were there, we remember them. And, and so we, we know those things. Sometimes I don't know things that happened in the past, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, and and we also know things that we've learned. You know, you covered that in, in your definitions, you know, the, the knowledge of the things that we acquire, or things that we know. But there are some things that we know by faith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We just know it. And so, for example, belief in God. How many of you have seen God, like physically seen God? Bless you. Okay, maybe not in a physical form, but you've you've experienced enough of God, you've seen enough of, of God's God's hand at work that collectively you know that there's a God. You know, we we know that Jesus Christ existed, and we know that the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. We know these things because of faith. And so there are some things that we just know by faith. Now Yes, sir. We know that Jesus is coming back, but we do not know him. That, that's a good point. You know, we, we, because it's a promise. And so by faith, we've, we've seen enough prophecy fulfilled. We've, we know the character of God. We, we believe in Christ. And so by that, we believe in faith that he's coming back. The word know, and actually it's the word we know, uh, that 
It's the word Edomen, okay? And uh, so it means to know, to possess information, or to recognize, realize, come to know, or to understand. Uh, the, the M-E-N on the end of this that's the root word, but the M-E-N on the end of it is what makes it first person plural. All right, so that's why this word means we know is because uh, the, the M-E-N makes it first person plural. Um, so we know things based on the information that we have and what experience we have with that information. If we have enough information to convince us an, as an outcome of an outcome, then we can say we know. Okay. For example, we know that if you drive 90 miles an hour on a curvy road and, and it's raining, we know you're going to have a wreck. Okay. We just know that because we have enough. We have enough. Uh, experience and you know uh, so anyway so so uh, the same thing applies to what we know about God as we discussed in just a little bit ago uh, so have you ever watched a uh, prequel of anything you know the easiest one to say is Star Wars so if you've ever been watching you know so you had you had episodes four five and six that started in 77 and then in the 90s they came out with one two three and there were certain things that you knew were going to happen because you know what happened later, right? Yeah. And so it didn't matter, uh, like, like certain, certain characters, if you're watching the prequel, uh, there's certain characters that, you know, like how many of you know Rogue One? Okay, so so yeah, so Rogue One, the, the two main characters right there at the end, you're like, well, they're not going to make it. I mean, you know they're not going to make it because they weren't in episode four, or they would have been a prominent character. So, you know, they're they're dying, you know. And then there's certain characters in in prequels that you're like, well, you know, I don't care how dire it gets, they're going to make it because you know that they're in later episodes, right? Sometimes you don't know because you're like, maybe they do that. <laughs> maybe they're just changing the whole canon, right? Sometimes I'm like, no, he's not going to die. You know, uh, everybody thought Jr. was dead, <laughs> and so anyway, uh, so so you get the point there. When you witness the character of God over and over, there are things that you become convinced of, and you may not be able to predict the future, but there are things you are convinced of because you know the character of God, and so you can say, "I know this because I know God." Let's move on to. Oh, there's that. <laughs> For we, uh, for those who love God. Now, people wield this scripture, all things work together for good, uh, pr pretty carelessly, I think. And, and it's like a blanket promise that all things work out together for good. But uh, what they don't realize is this is a conditional promise. Okay? The first condition is this, for those who love God. And so if you do not love God, this promise doesn't ap apply to you. You know, it's, it's not just a blanket promise that all things work together for good. Uh, and so what does it mean to love God? Let's start with Matthew 22:37. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus is responding to a, a question that was say, what's the greatest commandment? He was asked. And this would have been an easy answer to go to first because it's part of, does anybody know what Jewish prayer this is part of? Yeah, the Shema. It's part of the Shema. Every day they got up and they quoted this verse. This verse is part of a, a, a longer prayer. And so it would have been easy for Jesus to say, well, you know, it's part of the Shema. You know that. And so uh, he, he would go to this. But Israel had not always shown love to God, had they? And if we're being honest, sometimes we probably fall short of loving the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind, right? You know, there, there's some, some ways that we act that may be displeasing to him, some ways that, that uh, you know, that, that things that we do that we're not putting God first. Uh, in 1 John 5, 3, John says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so love is an action, isn't it? You know, love is not just a, a feeling. Love is not, you know, some people, some people think, well, we just fell out of love. Okay, love is not a feeling. You know, if you, if you fell out of love, then you weren't, you weren't 
acting, right? You you weren't doing the actions of love. Uh, first three, eight, uh, first. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. First John three eighteen says, "Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth." And so, husband and wife, if you love your husband, if you love your wife, then you have to do something. You have to act out love because it's not it's not just you can't just say I love you and then start beating them over the head, <laughs> literally or figuratively, uh, because it doesn't work that. So I like that. So we tell our spouse we love them, right? But what are the what are the right and wrong ways to show your spouse that you love them? Let's talk about wrong ways first. What's the wrong way to tell your spouse you love them? I love you, but. I love you, but <laughs> I love you, but. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anything before the but, just. Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna say it's with attitude. You can say I love you and mean nothing or mean anything. Okay. So if, if you if you said I love you, <laughs> that's a little that's a little different attitude behind that one, isn't it? What's what's another wrong way to show love? Uh, rolling your eyes when you are you saying something? There? <laughs> <laughs> well, some people show love by you know I buy you stuff that you know, you know, you know I have a job that ought to be enough. They don't you know, okay. meet the need of the other person. So that depending on what the stuff was, that could be a right way or a wrong way, right? <laughs> No, you can do something wrong, and instead of apologizing, you'd be like, so I got you these flowers, and I'd be like, cool, those are going to the trash until you can, you know, better have a conversation either way. Wow, Jeremy, we need to have some prayers. It's not us. <laughs> oh, I'm it's saying for a friend. For a friend. Right. <laughs> I don't get flowers, what are you talking about? Yeah, I'm not saying by personal experience, Jeremy's never gave me flowers. <laughs> Uh, what about what about staying gone all the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, you know, that 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 can be a, a wrong way. Okay, so let's let's flip that and let's say what are the right ways to show love to your spouse? Listening to what they say. Listening to what they say. Depends on what their love language is. Okay. Yeah. So knowing knowing their love language and what what they like. What they need. That, okay. What they need. Being respectful. Okay, respect. Patience. Patience. Long suffering. Long suffering. Being long suffering shows love. Sometimes that's true. Yeah. And serving. You know, you serve. Okay, to serve. Okay, paying attention to the little things. I'm not hearing anything that's, that's about feelings in here. And you can put someone else above yourself, you know, if you know that's what they're like. And so you do it even though it may not be your favorite thing. You're putting someone above yourself. Uh-huh. Watching a Hallmark movie, even though you don't want to. <laughs> 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 if that's what it took to show love, I'm going to watch it. That would not have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If that's what it took to show love. If I wanted to do, if I wanted to show her love the wrong way, I would we would watch a Hallmark movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you you can you can see by this though that that uh, we uh, there's indicators I guess of of uh, how we express our love to our spouse, and it's going to be different. You know, if, if you do the things to your spouse because it's what you like, you might be missing it completely. Okay, so you have to know what they like and, and vice versa. And it's the same way with God. If we want to show our love to God, there's some action required. You can't just say, oh, I love God, and then just do whatever you want that makes you happy because that's not going to be what's pleasing to God, and that's not showing love to God. So it's, it's knowing what he wants and, and doing what is pleasing to him. That is when we love God. Uh, beyond that, I have a question for you. Do you endear yourself to God? That's that's a little different, isn't it? Any of you parents in the room, okay, we're, we're not going to report this outside the room. Nobody's looking in the back window. 
How many of you have a favorite child? And you love each other. That, that's, that's, not, that's not fair, Keith. You're not supposed to say that. You love each well, you can't, you can't talk. <laughs> the brother and sister say, yeah. I have a golden child. Y'all figure out which one it is. <laughs> Brian, it's always the youngest. No, that's not I don't have a favorite kid. I have a favorite one for the day, and it's for the day. It's whichever one's giving me the least amount of trouble. Okay, see, and, and if I may put that a different way, the one that's endearing themselves the most to you that day. Uh, my, I, I had uh, my grandpa, I'll just call him Papa because that's what I called him, uh, was, was my mom's dad. Uh, I, I loved being around him, and I would, I would endear myself to him. Uh, even when I was a baby, you know, I, I clawed his face off and all this stuff. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I just loved being around him. And anytime we didn't, uh, except for a brief period of time, we didn't even live in the same town. But when we would go to De Leon, Texas, you know, it wasn't about going off and playing with the cousins and all that stuff to me. I wanted to stay with him. Wherever he went, that's where I wanted to go. I would, when he owned a gas station, I, w- I wanted to go down to the station and hang out at the station while he was working. Uh, when, when I was home and before he you know, wasn't able to drive anymore, he had a, it was like a 1968 Ford black uh, pickup step side, you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. And so he would, you know, I'd hear that thing coming around the corner and I'd run out to the road because I, I wanted to be close to him. And uh, so th- that was all growing up. That, that's the way our relationship was. And uh, he would he'd make it a point to, uh, you know, he would, you know, buy me some cowboy boots or he would, you know, take me and, and you know, make sure I had a good cowboy hat. And, you know, it, this is Texas, okay? And uh, so uh, my, my first car was a, was a, a 1974 AMC Gremlin. You know what a Gremlin is, right? Uh, and so, you know, I drove that for a year or so. A couple of years maybe, and I uh, got a, a phone call from him one day. It's like, hey Keith, I bought you a car. Like you did, you know. Well, tell me about it. It's, uh, it's got good tars. <laughs> that was that was the you know, main characteristic. It's like you know, don't know about the rest of it. Well, the first one was a 1968 Galaxy 500, and so I had I had uh, that for about a year, and then I got a phone call. It's like, hey Keith, I bought you a car. You did. Well, tell me about it. It's got good tars. <laughs> and so this one was a 1976 Ford Maverick, and so we were we were coming up just a little bit, moving up in the world, but, which uh, I always called a, a Maverick a poor man's Mustang. Uh, but but anyway. To my knowledge, never bought another grandkid of his, and he had many, a car. But I spent a lifetime of endearing myself to him. And that endearment brought favor. And so I'm, I'm, I'm telling you tonight that when we endear ourselves to the Father, we invite favor yes. in our life. Yes. Yes. And that comes with a commission to learn what God wants. And want to be with him and want to be in his presence and, and long to, to do what he, he wants and, and to uh, be with him. And so that's, that's endearing ourselves to God. Um, then it moves on and it says all things. All things is really just one word in the Greek. It's panta. Uh, every, it means everything. It can also mean everyone or always or forever or whole. So it's, a, it's a, like an all-inclusive word, if you will. Uh, depending on like its context, which which of those it means. So, uh, is the meaning of this verse then without limit? I mean, it says everything, right? It says all things. So, is it without limit, or are there limitations? Okay, uh, maybe we need some context to that. But uh, if we if we go back to Romans chapter one, uh, did did um, and we talked about the ungodly who have rejected the truth about uh, God were all those things working out for good. Because they were experiencing the wrath of God, right? Uh, because they they fell short of the, the one condition that we've already talked about. Uh, in general, is uh, is sin, does sin work out for good? Okay? Sin doesn't work out for good, does it? Uh, what about all things happening in the world today? Is is all things happening in the world today going to work out for good? No, because no, we've read the end of 
the book, right? <laughs> it's going to have to be destroyed and remade before it can be good. And so all things don't work out for good uh, in, in context, but we've already talked about one condition, which is uh, uh, all things for those who love God. I like the order of the original Greek because it puts the, the qualifier first, right? For those who love God, all things. The all things are those in light uh, in the life of the believer. So we're going to look at what Paul has talked about just in Romans 8 that is in the life of the believer. So let's look at some of these things. Okay, in verse 1, freedom from condemnation. Well, that's a good thing, right? So good thing in the life of a believer, we, we had, we're free from condemnation. Uh, then in verses 3 through 8, it talks about struggles with the flesh. Well, that, that kind of sounds hard. You know, it's not, not necessarily all good because we have this battle going back and forth between the, the flesh and the spirit. Then in verse 9, it says that the spirit of Christ is in you. Well, that's good. You know, that's, that's a good thing in our life. Uh, verses 10 and 11 it says we have life because of righteousness uh, that the spirit brings. And so that's a good thing. Verses 14 through 17, we are adopted as sons and daughters with the hope of eternal life. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, that, that's the best thing. You know, Howard told me when the text went out about Sunday school, he said, well, you know, if the rapture happens, we're not going to be there. And they're like, if the rapture happens, they're going to have to teach themselves. <laughs> so, but, but we have that hope uh, of that eternal inheritance. Then in verse 18, it talks about sufferings in this present time. Well, that's not good. You know, I, I don't want to sign up for the sufferings of the present time, but, but they come whether you sign up for it or not. And then in 23, it says we groan with creation while we wait for hope. So we do have a hope, but sometimes that hope seems, how many of you knows that sometimes it feels like it's way in the distance, right, as we're groaning with creation. And then in verse 26, it says that we're weak. And so there's a lot of good in the life of the believer, and there's a lot of struggle in the life of the believer. There's sufferings, and there's glory. And so what, what the context of this is saying that, that all of these things uh, work together for the believer. The one who loves God uh, works together for good. All right. So that work together is a Greek word that means uh, that that says uh, synergy or synergeo, and it means to work together, to cooperate, to assist. Uh, also can mean kind of like coworker or work along with. Uh, it's literally a compound word of two Greek words. Sun means together and ergon, which means work. That's the word synergy. There you go. That's the word synergy, that, where our word well, synergy comes from. Three. What's that? We always explained it one plus one can sometimes equal three. Okay. That's well, the sum of the the sum of the two, two is greater than the parts. Okay. Well, like uh, a motel at a restaurant. Yeah. Two things work together. They work. They work together. Well, let's look at that, uh, Richard. I'm gonna let you read that. Oh, I'm sorry, I stole your thing. <laughs> no, no, no. Interaction yeah. or, co or cooperation of two or more organizations, substances or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate parts. Boom! Isn't it awesome when when you're in sync with the teacher, right? <laughs> I mean, synergy is a great power. And That's right. And it appears in a lot of ways if you just think about it. And, and that can be your secret of success, you know. Exactly. And, and I you love this. You more out than you put in. I love this definition because of that. Mm -hmm. Because all these things work together. It, it's not just that it works together and we make it, mm -hmm. right? It works together for good. good. And so, uh, so that for good... Uh, we like the good, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I like. I wish I'd have included that in my notes. That you know, so one. <laughs> that, no, 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 no. That was good. One plus one equals three, so because God. when God when God pulls these things together, the result is good. Now, if I had a uh, if I had some ingredients up here, I started to do this, but then I thought that's a lot of trouble, and I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> <laughs> but if I had uh, if I got a tablespoon of flour. Who would, who would allow me to feed them a tablespoon of flour? No? No, no takers on that? Uh, what, about, uh, what about a tablespoon of sugar? Yeah, maybe. I remember at my grandma's house, I don't know if I've ever 
you know, I don't even know if you know this, but, you know, she always had the, the you know, the sugar bowl on the table, you know, and we'd get a, we'd get a teaspoon. I say we, me probably, but anyway, get a, get a tablespoon, I mean a teaspoon and, and just get a spoon of sugar and just. There you lie, mother. Mm. I don't have a sugar. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, right. So just. Remember so, the song that goes along with that? Uh uh. Teaspoon of sugar, Epsom medicine, go down. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do know that song. Uh, how about, how about a tablespoon of baking powder? No, uh, no, no, no baking. With that, well, yeah, I guess so. What about a tablespoon of cinnamon? You know, how long ago that was? That was uh, maybe was 10 years ago, maybe Howard or whatever. There was a challenge. You know how they do those challenges. And it was the cinnamon challenge and the tablespoon. And I watched a few of those. Apparently, you can't eat a tablespoon of cinnamon. You put it in your mouth and you try it and then it's like, and it's just like a, a cloud of cinnamon comes out. So uh, what about what about a tablespoon of salt? Mm-hmm. No. no, no takers on a tablespoon of salt. Burn your mouth. What about a tablespoon of milk? Who would allow me to feed them a tablespoon of milk? Yeah. That'd be okay. <laughs> Some of you is like it depends if it's almond milk or or lactate or A2 milk or you know what you know all these special special milks. I've never figured out how to milk an almond. But uh, what about a, a tablespoon of vegetable oil? No, no, no tablespoon of vegetable oil. Uh, what about a tablespoon of raw eggs? Okay, but you could. I mean, there's there's some people for fitness, you know, they mix up, you know, eggs and some other stuff, and they just drink it down, you know. But uh, so so I mean, it would be okay. It would be like pleasant, maybe or whatever. But what if I took all of that stuff and I mixed it together in in the right proportions, and I baked them together? Okay, it it would be it would be something like that. It would be my cinnamon muffins that I made for you today. And so that's why we need two pots of coffee. That's right. This, this is this is my cinnamon re- cinnamon muffin recipe. Thank you. So I made you cinnamon muffins today. Terry Terry did not cook them. I, I made them. Are they safe, Terry? They're safe. <laughs> Y'all may not know, but I'm I'm a pretty good cook. We went through those ingredients one at a time. Some of them you would eat, some of them you wouldn't eat. And it's just like life that we have some parts of our life that we'd like to leave out, wouldn't we? Yeah. I mean, there would be some some parts that we just like, you know, I you know, I just soon just not have to go through that. And then there's some things in our life that we want more of that. You know, we, we, we want, uh, you know, we, we welcome the good, the good times and the good blessings. But God says, it, it, no matter the, the good nor the bad, I can take all of that and I can bake it together and I can make something good. And I promise you it's better than cinnamon muffins. That was pretty good, though. So Paul, uh, Paul doesn't say that everything ha- that happens to a Christian is good or is even good for him. Uh, and it also sa- doesn't say that God makes all things happen, does it? Sometimes we do things to ourselves. But God can take whatever you do as a believer and he can add that together with other things and still make something good uh, happen for it. So who is the promise for that uh, for that all things work together for good for? Okay, and for those who are called. Okay, uh, now the Calvinists would understand this as uh, uh, existing for a narrow group of elect who God has chosen uh, to bless. Don't miss next week. Because we're going to talk about Calvinism next week. And, and we're going to talk about uh, how to, to look at the scriptures in, in context and, uh, and, and find out what the Bible actually says about those thoughts and that theology. But uh, today we're going to kind of skirt around that and save that for next week. But called in is, a, is a Greek word, kletes, which uh, means summoned or invited. 
uh, a call can also be a vocation, right? Uh, you know, we have even in scriptures when it's talking about Romans uh, eleven twenty nine says, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Yeah. Uh, Ephesians 4, 1, it says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And so a calling can also be something that you've been called to do or, or an assignment. Um, there is a call that goes out, and that call is the gospel, right? 2 Thessalonians 2.14 says, To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then that gospel... Oh, am I behind again? There we go. All right. Thank you, Cody. Uh, so that's 2 Thessalonians 2.14. But that call... Uh, it goes out to everyone. Mark 16:15. it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so it's not, it's not a call that's limited to just certain people. It's not, there's not just a certain few that it applies to, but the call, the gospel goes out to all people. But not just any call, right, that Romans 8, 28 applies to, not just some blanket call, but a call... I don't know what that was about. <laughs> According to his purpose. Jeremiah 21, 11, a lot of people like this verse, don't they? And, and I, you know, there's a, a young man in our church that has it tattooed on his back, as a matter of fact. You know, it's just, you know, a lot of people like Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Do you know when this scripture or when this this prophecy was yielded or this promise was was uh, uh, spoken? When they were going into Babylonian captivity. Okay. So they were in a bad time, weren't they? Yeah. They were under suffering. They were under captivity. And as a matter of fact, it was going to be seven, 70 years. You know, part of, you know, if you go up to verse 1 of Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah's telling them, look, go ahead and settle in. Uh, you know, marry, get a house, plant a crop, uh, because there were other prophets, there were false prophets in the same time that were saying, you know, in two years God's going to deliver, so don't get settled in, you know, don't, don't, you know, just stay in your tents and be ready, because God, Jeremiah is saying, no, the Lord's saying, go ahead and settle in, you're going to be here for 70 years, so, so, you know, you're going to be going through this, this suffering, you're going to be going through this captivity time, and so just settle into it. And, and just live your best life uh, while all this is going on. But the Lord has plans for you, and he knows what those plans are, and they're plans for good, and they're plans to proper, prosper you. See, that message can resonate with us today because sometimes we want, how many of you want your trials and, and tribulations to be over with tomorrow? Yeah. But sometimes it takes a while to navigate those things. And sometimes you have to go through periods of suffering. Uh, sometimes it's just due to living life. Sometimes it's things that you brought on yourself. But even in those things, even in those times and those sufferings, we have a promise and we have a future hope that, that God will take all of those things and he's going to make them work out for good. Why? Because you love God and because he has purpose for you and he has designed a plan for your life. And so no matter how bad you mess it up, God's going to take that and he's going to... Some, th some things I think on my life, he just has to sweep under the rug. It's like, you know, Keith, don't look under the rug. It's not pretty under there. But, but he, makes all thing, he, he makes all things good and, and he takes those things and, and uh, works them together. The word purpose is a, a word that... Uh, a Greek word, uh, prothesin, which means plan, purpose, or will, or intention. So if we've answered the call and are among the called, our first purpose is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, in Romans 8:29, which we'll talk about next week, our, our first, uh, the, the first thing that we're predestined to is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so that's his plan for us. Uh, beyond that, he has kingdom purpose for you and a role in participating in his larger plan. Have you ever had a plan and then had setbacks to that plan. Yeah. You know, we, we've all been there. And you have to kind of readjust and, and uh, kind of, uh, you know, back up and start over, if you will. Uh, Israel's a prime example of this. 
God came to Abraham and he said, I have a plan. My plan is, Abraham, because you're a faithful man and you're pleasing to me, that I'm going to bless the whole world because of you. And I'm going to make you a great nation. And that nation is going to be a blessing to the world. And so uh, then Israel finds itself coming to nation size, I guess you will, in slavery. Because they didn't trust God. Uh, Jacob didn't trust God enough to uh, keep his family in Canaan and provide there. He moved, he moved over there. That's a, a whole different thing we could get into. But uh, so, so uh, God sends Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Israel. I mean, out of Egypt. And they come out of Egypt with which is magnificent miracles and all this stuff happened. How many of you, if you walked through the Red Sea and, and you saw all the plagues and, and God uh, saved you from them and, and everything that happened to Israel, how many of you think you could just, you could pretty much live for God after that. Yeah. yeah I can't we, we'd like to think we would, <laughs> right? But some reason they just couldn't get it, and so God brings them out in the desert. He uh, gives them His law and makes covenant with them. And then after that covenant, uh, He marches them straight over and says, "Okay, now it's time to go into the promised land." They didn't go into the promised land because they were afraid of the giants. They were afraid of the battle that was going to ensue. And they didn't trust God enough to be able to do that. Why, why do you think that was? Why did that, that group of people not believe that they could go in and take the land? They still had slave mentality. Because they still had slave mentality. All they had never known is being subservient to somebody else. And so God had to say, okay, if you're not going to go in, then I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to bring you around and all of the old has to die off before I can bring you into the land of promise. And so for 40 years, they wandered around. All the, all the old died off. But in the meantime, they fought a lot of battles, didn't they? Mm-hmm. And battle after battle after battle, they won. They went against giants like Og of, of Bashan and, and uh, the king of the Amorites and uh, Sihon. And so they... they uh, defeated all those on, on that side of the Jordan. And so then when it came time to cross over the Jordan, what does this next generation feel? We're ready. All we've ever done was win. And so they felt like they could go in and do it. And so sometimes God uh, has to bring us through other places in our life so that the old can die off and so that the new can come. What? Kill, kill, you're still hung up on that one, aren't you? Uh, Jeremy, never become the old spouse. <laughs> but but uh, God brings us sometimes through uh, places, not, not that he designs suffering for you, but he allows us to go through things sometimes so that the old can die off, so that we can experience winning and then come back around to the promise that he has to us. And he takes all those things and he works them together for our good so that we can claim the promises that he has for us. So if God can work out on that grand of a scale, how much more can he work through the failures and the sufferings of our life to bring about the good of his purpose? One final scripture that I want to leave with you. In 1 Peter 1.6, it says, In this you rejoice, now, uh, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Anybody ever been grieved by various trials? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So no matter what trials and what sufferings and tribulations you go through in your life, those things refine you and those things make you better so that you can have his ultimate salvation. And that could come in a lot of forms. We know the ultimate salvation is, is to be with him forever in, in that rapture you were talking about, right? Uh, to, to be in heaven forever with him. But we can go through victories and we can go through things that, that, that one plus one plus uh, equals three. We can have that three even here on earth. 
when we love God and we're called according to his purpose and allow him to work all those things together for good. And I hope this encourages you today that, you know, that, that no matter, you may be going through a trial right now. You may be going through something that, that you may consider as suffering. But keep loving God and keep being called according to his purpose. And he'll make all those things work together for good.